Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Alison, the online piano and violin tutor. If the violin is shaking when you're trying to do vibrato, that is the number one sign that you are attempting vibrato too soon. Number one, the first thing you're gonna need is a violin. I have been playing the violin since I was four years old. I went to university and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in music. With the amazing talent that's Alison Sparrow. Alison, come out here. So bear with me if there are any technical hitches, I'm sure it'll be fine. For about five years, I was an examiner for the London College of Music. And over the years, I've seen basically the music world from every kind of possible view, really. And because of that, it has enabled me to write my own violin course. Hello, everyone. Back. Well, so there we go. That's kind of all you really know, need to know. And don't forget, guys, anyone can learn to play the violin. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Alison, the online piano and the online violin tutor. Uh, nice to see you all again. I hope you've all had a really good week and are looking forward to the weekend. Let's see who we've got um, joining us today. Um, Chris Holland, hi, nice to see you again. DIY Slime Lab, I love that name, hi. Um, Adam M4, not sure if I've seen you here maybe before. Kersey, hello. Uh, Persian, hello. Tessa, don't think I've seen you in a little while. Um, okay, oh, Bia, hi Bia, nice to see you. I definitely haven't seen you in a little while. Tracy, hello, oh, they're all coming out of the woodwork now. Um, okay, so I guess we just wait for some questions to um, come rolling in. I've got a couple of questions um, that people have mentioned from last week, but before I do that, before we just sort of get started, uh, let me just remind you all of these, my one to 30 violin course. I know a lot of you are following are following this course. A lot of you know about it, but also I know a lot of you drop into these lives and you don't know anything about that. So this is my one to 30 violin course that you can see here. Um, 100% downloadable, 59.99 US dollars, um, and it's available to download. Anybody in the world can purchase this. The course guarantees to take you from a complete beginner to a very decent, accomplished, uh, intermediate kind of player. And it's everything you need to know in that course. So literally the only thing you need is your violin, your bow, and your enthusiasm to, enthusiasm to want to learn to play the violin. And if you click on the, on the, on the link below it will take you to my google drive where you can access the first 10 lessons absolutely free there's no catch or anything like that if you like the lessons after that you can then purchase the book course and follow on and, and off you go from there so um bitzerker hello priestess hello um rolando hello adam m4 has a question okay uh let me just move that down a little bit so i can see what i'm doing okay adam m4 says what pieces should you start with if you were to take a break from the violin for a while and start playing again? The pieces you were playing before or easier pieces? That's quite a good question, actually. So if you are taking a bit of a hiatus from the violin, maybe you are, I don't know, maybe you haven't played for six months or, or more or a year, whatever, and you're, you're, you're ready to time in your life now, everything's stars have aligned, everything's fine, and you're all ready to start the violin again. Um, and this probably goes for any instrument, actually. So piano, clarinet, flute, whatever. I would suggest that you go back to more or less the last thing that you were playing. So start from where you uh, left off, really. That's probably the best thing to do. But also what I would do is what Adam said, is go to something just a little bit easier as well to kind of ease yourself in. But to be perfectly honest, it, depend, it depends what you were doing at the time of leaving off. If you were playing music that was very, very complicated, uh, the kind of music that was challenging you to the core, um, obviously I wouldn't go back to doing that because you never even nailed it in the first place to start back up again with that. So I would just go, in that case, I'd go back a step um, and, and you know, start with those kind of pieces that, that you were playing or the pieces that you'd nailed right before you got onto the complicated, more challenging stuff, um, if that's the case. If you were just sort of plodding along and you were playing away and you don't remember anything particularly challenging about the pieces, then go back to that particular piece. But at the end of the day, there, there's no right or wrong you would just need to go back and repeat yourself and go over the lot, just retrace the last few steps just to make life easier for you. I wouldn't literally just pick up where you left off and start playing the brand new piece that you started to play, maybe got about a quarter of the way through and then didn't bother anymore. I wouldn't do that because you're just going to find that too 
uh, too complicated. So go back to where you were. If it was a little bit complicated, bring it back a little bit. Okay. Um, per Jung says, my fourth finger vibrato makes, vi makes my violin shake, but when I do it with the other fingers, it doesn't move. That's completely normal. Fourth finger vibrato is just horrendous. It's like the worst thing on earth. It's so, so difficult to do. It's because of the, because we don't have any muscles in the hand, they're, they're tendons. And we've got a tendon that sort of works, in, works with these two fingers alone, I do believe, uh, that runs down there. And you don't really have any control over it because you can't, uh, you can't really strengthen a tendon. You can't do anything with a tendon. It just, it is what it is, which is why the fourth finger is always the, you know, it, it's always the finger that locks. It's always the finger that just doesn't really work at all. And it's always the finger that's just hanging around the rest of the hand, but you just sort of need it for balance and for other things. But when you're doing vibrato, sorry, let's just move my hair out of the way. When you're doing vibrato, it's easier to do vibrato on the first finger, the second finger, and the third finger, fourth finger is just difficult. So the, I think when I do, when I have to do fourth finger vibrato, and as violinists, we try and not to do fourth finger vibrato. We do everything we can to avoid it. That's not to say that we don't do it, but instead of doing fourth finger vibrato, I can move that up to the second finger in third position. So this is first position at the moment. So I've got finger one, finger two, finger three, finger four in first position. Third position starts there. Third position starts where the third finger is in first position. Second finger starts where the second finger is in first position. Fourth position starts where the fourth finger is in first position. Fifth position starts where the fifth finger would be if I had one in first position, six, you know, and so on. So third position is going to start here. Actually, it's just on that dot. So if I move up there and I put my second finger down, my second finger, is it not playing exactly the same note as what the fourth finger would be playing? So rather than doing a fourth finger vibrato, I would just find a way in the music, however, to slip up into second, uh, sorry, third position and play vibrato with my second finger. If obviously in in the circumstance that you're not able to do that, initially if you're looking at a fourth finger vibrato, which is usually on you know instead of doing an open string, then we would find another way of doing that. So instead of the fourth finger, we we jump into another position. If we cannot do that, if that just is not a possibility, then we have to do fourth finger vibrato. What I tend to do then is I tend to push the finger down quite solidly. So instead of having just a little bit of the finger on, you know, I want I want all of it. I want the whole entire pad of that finger to be touching that string. And when I'm doing the fourth finger vibrato as well, I almost I'm almost pushing down a little bit harder because I don't want that finger to kind of slip. So it's almost like you can just see the strain and the tension on this finger, but there's no other way of doing it. Other than that, it's just a case of practice. So I, I do believe that the better you are at uh, vibrato anyway with the main with with the main three fingers, your fourth finger will just come along for the ride. So if you're not very good at vibrato with the main three fingers, your fourth finger isn't going to very be very good. If you're very good with vibrato and you've mastered it, then by default your fourth finger is going to be really good. Um, but yes, it's just it it is. It, it is a bit of a pain. It's a bit of a pain for me as well, but the only reason why I can do it as well as I can is just because I've been, I've just been playing a long time. So. So I just had a lot of practice at doing it. That's all. Plus my vibrato is, is very good and it's been developed for years and years anyway. So that's it with it. If you're struggling with it, you've just got to find a way to get over it. There's no quick fix or, or anything like like that. Um, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's have a look. What's next? Um, DIY Slime Lab. Any tips on how I can play scales a bit faster finger wife, both, both slurred and detached? Um, work up to it. Just, just play them faster. There is no, uh, again, there's, there's no, there's no real real tip I can think of that. Uh, the, the, the main way that you want to play anything fast or the main way you can play anything fast or get to play anything fast is to start it very slowly, keep playing it at that tempo, move up to the next tempo, keep playing at that, 
move on to the next tempo, keep playing that, keep, you know, and keep moving up just with the tempo. Uh, this is possibly where a metronome would come in and help you a little bit. Um, but in terms of playing fast, there is no, again, there's no um, get it done quick kind of feature or button with this. It's just a case of working up to play it faster and faster. Um, beer. Yes, I'm back. Are spiccato or staccato notes always played on the up bow? And I just didn't know that. Um, I'm referring to bar 41 from the Apolitan song from last week. So, uh, no, not, not necessarily. Um, the Neapolitan song that we did last week was off the top of my head. So staccato and I mean, staccato is more, so it's more going to be that you're just shortening the bow spiccato is the one where you're actually jumping off the bow. So it de uh, so yeah, you're jumping off the bow. So it sort of depends on, on what you're doing, but um, it, it, that particular piece was down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up, and we're just, so we're doing upwards with, with the staccato, uh, sorry, the spiccato, but you can, but you can do it up and down bow. It really doesn't matter. It just depends on the actual piece but spiccato and staccato are done in any bow format, depending on the piece of music. Um, okay. Um, Adam, that's perfect. You are welcome. Um, Garf. Garf299, do I need to study music theory or anything to gain a better understanding before attempting the violin? No, no you do not because, um, not sure when you joined, um, at the beginning I showed you my book series here. I go through theory in my book series. So these are the books I have here, I just printed them out. 100% downloadable course, 30 lesson, guarantees to take you from a complete beginner to a very decent accomplished intermediate player. These book courses, you don't need to have anything else. The whole point is, is that this book course is guaranteed to take you from a complete beginner to a very decent accomplished intermediate player. And literally the only thing you need is a violin and a bow and, and you. The theory is taught alongside this as and when you need it. So for example, um, there's a little bit of theory that we've got going in book two. Um, so for example, at the end of book two, we're talking about, this is at the end of book two, for example. So we're talking about dotted notes and things like that. So in terms of theory, it's more rudimental, rudimental theory because that's, that's really the only thing you need to know. So it will be telling you about time signatures and, and rhythms and all that kind of thing. So everything that you need to know is set out in these, these books. That's why you need the books to accompany with the, the videos to help you with all that kind of side of things. So no, you don't need, with my course, obviously I can't speak for anybody else's, with my course, you don't need anything else at all. All the theory is in that. You literally need zero knowledge and I will teach you everything from complete scratch. That's the whole point of this book course and that's what this book course has been derived from. Those of you that know a little something about music, well obviously you can skip those little parts if you already know about dotted rhythms and uh, crotchets and quavers, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, you know, and all that kind of thing, time signatures and, and whatnot. You can skip all of that if you like, um, but no, you don't need anything. Okay, Frances Xavier, I bought a new violin, how to start and proficient in playing the violin. The book course that I just mentioned that came up here, links are underneath the music, uh, sorry, the links are underneath this, um, this video. Uh, it's because my brain is thinking 10 steps ahead and it obviously can't cope. Uh, Gilbert, hello from Florida, nice to see you again. Katie, nearly forgot the live, <laughs> brilliant. Um, Ah, Hikagea001. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly all this time. Uh, hi, Alison. Is it advisable to practice long bows with a metronome as a beginner? Also, while doing the down bow, my elbow tends to get tense, which causes the bow to shake. Any tips on this? Um, you don't have to practice long bows with the metronome. It's it's you know it's it's completely up to you. it's completely up to you. There's a difference with you just playing lots of long note uh, long bows and then you know, just playing them, just playing random notes with long bows, but then you've got to incorporate that into your piece of music as well. So just 
because you want to play long bows it doesn't mean to say you have to play everything in long bows because not every piece of music is gonna uh, is gonna need you to play anything with long bows but just be aware that you're playing more bow uh, long more bow is always better than less bow because you get a much bigger more resounding sound and a more open sound as well but playing with a metronome I, I don't really see that how how that's going to benefit um and the second part of the question was while doing the down bow my elbow tends to get tense which causes the bow to shake it's probably more i would say if anything's getting tense it probably feels like maybe it's getting more tense around the arm than the actual elbow you can't really it's quite difficult to tense an elbow you're either going to be tensing the top part of the arm or you're going to be tensing the bottom part of your arm so it might be something actually that you're gripping too much around here so maybe you might want to look into your bow grip to see just to double check and make sure that your bow grip is is on point um uh asama kayani what if i can't purchase your book you can you can purchase the book on online there's a link underneath everything is 100 percent downloadable um if you can't purchase the book then maybe you might be able to find you might be able to find some free resources online possibly um okay uh persian says can you explain or tell the difference between the rhythm and timing and dotted rhythm where it is on your books page so there is some dotted rhythm in book two which was on page which is lesson 19 page 38 so if you've got this book everything is about dotted rhythms it's probably too complicated for me to explain in this kind of video here because i'd need kind of things to show but it's it is it's all in dotted rhythm is explained in there 38 lesson 19 book two um right what else have we got uh let me just make sure i don't miss any questions i'm sorry if i miss any questions if i have just write them out again and i will do my best to answer them um tessa downloaded your course last week it's great thank you i hope you're enjoying it hi archie paul taylor hi allison i just found my old violin and thought i would have a go at playing the game playing again but i kind of have sausage digits <laughs> for finger um any tips on not pressing two strings at the same time do you know what uh, fat fingers or large fingers shouldn't really make any difference on playing the violin there are lots of um, there are lots of men, I suppose I, I say men in particular, uh, just because men generally do have sort of wider fingers than women, but there are lots of men that play the violin. I mean, Itzhak Perlman is arguably the best, if not one of the world masters at playing the violin, and he's got quite pretty, pretty big fingers. So it shouldn't actually be an issue because when you're actually putting your finger down, the pads of your finger, the pads of your finger are actually round. So when you put your finger down, it's not like your finger is completely flat it's not like it's it's like a a t-shaped is it it is slightly rounded so you it doesn't matter whether your fingers are coming over the string and and they're playing all all strings at once that's irrelevant i mean my my fingers there are over at least three of the strings however if i played on just one if i put the bow on just one of those strings that's all that's going to come out so as long as i'm aiming intentionally onto where my larger finger was going as long as my bow is playing on that string it shouldn't actually it shouldn't be a problem people always seem to think it's a problem if they've got bigger fingers or fatter wider fingers or whatever or even smaller hands you it's more of something that you have to find an adjustment for you if you've got smaller fingers that's great as far as I, i'm concerned you've got an advantage to, to playing the violin if you've got longer ones then you have to adjust you know, if you've got longer fingers, you might find it easier to hold the violin the way I do. My fingers are slightly on the longer side, so you might find it easier to hold it with the thumb, the pad of the thumb at the side and hold it like that. Whereas a lot of people will hold it with the violin up, uh, with the neck of the violin up in there. And then for me, it's like, well, I've, I've got all this excess hand and I just, I, I, I don't know what to do with it. Do you know what I mean? So it's a, it, everything's all crunched, but if I hold with my thumb if I hold with my thumb down here, then my hand is more down and my fingers are much closer to where they need to be. So it's a case of just finding what's good what's good for you. So maybe try not to hold the violin too much round like that because that might interfere with the fingers. Maybe hold the violin with your thumb or the neck, I should say, with the thumb so you can just hold with the very tips of your fingers and see if that helps. But as I said, putting two finger, putting fingers on two strings doesn't matter. 
because it's what's going to be isolated when you're playing with the bow. Hope that has helped. Um, if you could answer, what was your first violin? Is it still there with you? Um, honestly, I can't remember what my first violin was. Uh, it would have been a different size to what I've got now. I've had the current violin that I've got now for 10, 11, 12 years. Before that, I, I can't honestly remember anything about it. I just kind of exchanged it in as quickly as I possibly could because I wanted to move on and then, you know, just, just got this one. Um, but it wasn't a brand or anything like that. I, I honestly can't remember. My parents bought the first violin that I had for me. Um, Garth, thank you for the breakdown on music theory. Last question, and it may sound dumb. There's no dumb questions here, so don't worry. Is there any difference between a violin or a fiddle, or is it just cultural music style? And if so, are are the basics? The violin and uh, the violin and the fiddle are the exact same thing. So here's an example. Here's a violin. Here's a fiddle. <laughs> it's the exact same thing. So this is the violin and this is the fiddle. The difference between the violin and the fiddle is just a style of music. It's like saying, um, it's like saying, you know, uh, modern pop music or, you know, uh, Dean Martin and, I don't know, Dizzy Rascal or something like that. It's still singing it's still music but one is going to be sort of rapping and one is going to be singing to a melody but it's both singing with the voice so it's it's more it is you're right it's more of a a, a cultural more a genre thing in terms of playing if you're playing the violin let's just say that's going to be more classical let's push it down that route and then you're going to be doing all the all the fancy stuff that you do in all these books and um vibrato and all that kind of thing more more kind of classical music think mozart beethoven that kind of thing if you're playing fiddle music it's a lot more relaxed fiddle music will get you to the basics and that's about it you kind of stay at the basics so it's a, a less complicated version of the violin i guess but the music is very limited so if you're playing classical music you can play pretty much anything you like but that's not to uh, be offensive towards anybody that plays the fiddle because people who are very good fiddle play players are very, very good at what they do. They're very specific at what they do, but they're also very talented. So it'd be unfair to sort of tar them with the brush that it's just basic beginner stuff because it isn't. What I mean by that is that you're just not learning all the spiccato and the martelé in the third position, the fifth position. You know, you're not learning all of that kind of stuff granted but those that have mastered fiddle i mean i i'm not a fiddle player it's not my area of expertise jazz playing is not an area it's a whole different thing i'm a classical violinist classically trained and that's that's what i do and that's what i play so yes it's just uh it's just a cultural kind of thing but in terms of actually playing you could for argument's sake you could learn from this course and you could go off and do either fiddle playing and or normal kind of classical music playing whatever you like so it starts off at the same thing but you still need to learn you would both need to learn the same sort of uh, the same stuff okay uh that was a very long answer for a question that i could have answered really quickly um right beer i play in a non-professional orchestra and it's the only time i play with other people i struggle with counting the notes do you recommend i practice with a metronome to address this yes i do I, if, when you're playing with other people, you can no longer march to the beat of your own drum. You have to work towards them. You have to march to the beat of their drum, obviously. So you don't want to, you don't want to be going off and doing what, what you're doing. But if you're playing with a group of people, usually or an orchestra or something like that, they, they will give you the music so that you can take that home and practice it. And they will expect you to practice your part. So you're not letting down the team as, as it were when when you're meeting up with them once a week or whatever it is. But playing with a metronome will specifically help you because it's all about playing with other people. So everybody is going to be playing to a set metronome, i.e. the conductor who is at the, the head of the orchestra. So you're going to have to play to his beat, whatever he wants, if he wants to slow down, speed up, whatever it is. Or well, they, I should say, it could be a woman. So yes, playing with a metronome will help with that significantly. But the beauty of playing with people is that that's one thing that you learn to 
it's not it's it's less selfish when you're playing on your own it's just you isn't it you can just do whatever you want you can stick on a piano recording or a piano backing track or something like that and you play along with that when you're playing with other people you've got to be less selfish and you've got to be more on the ball with uh you know with your your notes and your part but also your timing as well so yes absolutely 100 in this in instance a metronome will totally help you um right Anne Mole. Hello. I haven't seen you in a little while, I don't think. Hope you've been all right. Um, do long arms have an effect and cause problems while down bowing? My arms are very long. No, I shouldn't think so. I mean, if your arms are very long, you're just not going to get to the bottom, are you? It doesn't, you don't, just because you've got a lot of arms doesn't mean to say you have to use it. Some people have the same problem when they have short arms. So they just use as much bow as they can for them and just compensate. Remember, it's all going to be related to your, your body, isn't it? So if you've got long arms, it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't mean to say you need a longer bow. Get a standard size bow. And if you're bowing and you get down to the end of the bow and you've still got plenty of arm knocking about, it doesn't matter. It just, it's, it's, it's something that just, you know, would, would be completely irrelevant. So no long arms do not, you know, make any more or less of a difference. Just use the bow up until it's gone and then go back up again. Um, Adam. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, right, Anne Mole, I seem to have an ongoing reoccurring issue with close second fingers to the first finger, for example, C natural on the A string. It's very challenging. Um, how is that challenging? Can you be a little bit more specific? What are you finding is the problem with that? Uh, yes, thank you very much for that, Adam. We appreciate that. Um, Archie, do you recommend having a feedback on progress from a tutor while taking your course i'm about to embark on the journey and learning uh, to play the violin uh yes i mean having a private teacher is is always going to trump everything isn't it because you've got the feedback from having someone that can actually tell you what you're doing wrong and they can see what you're doing in this that and the other however you know a lot of people don't have access to that and that's exactly where my course comes in w one thing i would say is that if you if you find a teacher or if you find someone that can help you, you would then want to be following their course. They wouldn't want to be um, particularly teaching their way. And then you downloading all my book series and playing from that. And then it's, it's going to a little bit, it's going to be a little bit conflicting unless uh, said person or said tutor, whoever it was that you found was quite happy to, for you to take the lead on what it is that you want to learn. I.e., if you want to go through this course, and then just kind of accompany you or just sort of help kind of guide you through it in a way. It sort of depends. But I mean, yes, if you can get any form of feedback, of course, it's going to be great. But I would just be careful what kind of feedback in terms of if it's an actual teacher, teacher, follow what the teacher says. And you can use the little bits that I say as kind of addendum or subsidiary sort of stuff. But make I would just make sure that you follow one person's course. If you're following my course, follow my course. If you're with a teacher, you know, be led by what the teacher is going to lead you. Because there's nothing worse as a teacher than having two people teaching because it can just not that it, it could just be a little bit interfering because I have a way of teaching things. So I won't teach certain things at certain times because they don't, I, I don't believe that you need to know so-and-so at that period of time in your course. I think you need to know it at this period of time in your course. Whereas the other teacher might completely disagree with that. And that's when you're kind of going to get conflicting sort of things. So just, you know, bear that in mind. But yes, if you can always get feedback, that's, you know, you can't, you can't beat feedback from a violinist or a teacher or something, can you? Okay. Um, SSB73Q. Hello. I understand that rosin has a shelf life. How often should I replace my rosin? Well, to be honest, uh, I don't really replace my rosin really sort of ever. Um, does rosin have a shelf life? Yes and no. It depends on what it's made of. A lot of them are made from bark sap. So yes, they do say that they do have a life to it. But for something that's so sort of... In, something that I feel would be so insignificant, I don't really feel that I would notice much of a difference if I had a brand new fresh cake of rosin or I had a rosin that was five, six, seven, eight years old. I think with the... With the, with the, I think the difference would be completely negligible, potentially. I mean, 
you yes they sort of do have a shelf life because they're made from the sap of the tree so yes it would be technically wrong for me to say no that they don't but i i'll be honest with you i don't bother repl i don't bother replacing them i don't i don't bother enough to sort of re replace them if i was a world class violinist then yes i would probably i'd be replacing it and it would be part of the job and it would something it would be something that you do but i don't do that and i don't find it harms the violin or um, I don't feel when I have bought new cakes when I've doubled up because I have them in different cases just in case I forget them and I haven't got to keep taking them out of cases. I can't say that I've really noticed a difference between, oh, that's a fresh cake of rosin, that. Look at the sound there. I can't say I've noticed a huge difference between a fresh cake of rosin and a, and a cake of rosin that I've had for, for a decade. I'll be you know perfectly honest, honest with you. But if the rosin is not looking so fresh anymore and you feel like you want to change it up, then you know by all means go and do that. Uh, or if the rosin is getting down quite substantially, then go ahead and do that. But um, for me personally, I've not noticed a huge difference to warrant spending another £20 or another $20 buying a, a, a piece of rosin every couple of years or something like that. But obviously, you know, do 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 whatever you feel you want to do. If you want to freshen up, then, you know, by all means um right where are we uh vera ashley i created a channel just to ask this question is it okay that i don't use a chin rest at all the only it's the only way i can hold it without hands you can play with whatever you do and don't want to do really as long as the bottom line for me is that as long as you are holding the violin correctly so as long as the violin is on the shoulder as long as your violin is as long as your chin is where the chin should be i mean I don't know whether playing without a chin rest might be the best thing to do. What I would potentially tell you to do is maybe try a smaller chin rest. This is called the Mulco chin rest, M-U-L-K-O. You should be able to buy this, but this is called the Mulco chin rest. And the reason why it's filthy. So please don't ignore, please ignore all of that. But it, it, yeah, it, it needs cleaning. So ignore, ignore that. But look how thin... Uh, I don't have another violin here with me that I can check it with, but go and have a look at your violin. But look how thin, uh, look how thin the violin, uh, the, the chin rest is, sorry. A lot of the chin rests, they're quite bulky. So every time I get a new violin, an electric violin, whatever it is that I've got, I will immediately get rid of that chin rest and I will replace it with a Mulco one because I just find that they sit here, they don't jap up into this, this part here, isn't immediately poking into there. I don't feel like it's, you know, my chin is all the way up here. So maybe buy, if you're talking about a chin rest, maybe buy a nicer chin rest. If you're talking about a shoulder rest, I don't use a shoulder rest anyway. So again, whatever you do or don't use, it doesn't matter. A chin rest is nice to have because it will keep your, it is nice to have something that isn't going to kind of potentially slip out. So I would worry if you didn't have a chin rest that you might sort of, you'd be slipping around. My skin is slipping around here. So I would maybe have something there. You can even get those little, um, you know, those little party feet, the skull, is it shoal or skull party feet? You get the little gel pads that you can put in your high heels that you put at the ball of your feet to stop your, uh, to stop the pain from all the high heels or stop your feet slipping. Um, they kind of have a little bit of sticky on the bottom. So you could peel off the sticky, just put it, put the sticker on your hand to take a little bit of the stick off so that you don't take any of the um, any of the varnish on, and maybe you could put one of those on just to just to give your chin a little bit of a grip. So I've seen people do things like that before, and that might help. But at the end of the day, as long as the violin is where it should be, chin rest, no chin rest, violet shoulder rest, no shoulder rest. You know, you do you as long as everything is in the right place. Uh, Tessa, how much money should I spend on a rosin? I think I have a cheap one. You probably want to be looking at anywhere between sort of 15 pounds and sort of upwards. I don't think you need to go crazy and buy anything stupid, but I'd say anywhere between 15, 20 pounds, 15, 20 dollars, something like that would be a decent rosin. And that would last you a very, very, very long time. And it will be a nice rosin that is in a nice cake, nice sap. Uh, nice quality ingredients. The dust isn't going to be falling off. It isn't going to be sticky. It isn't going to be chewing around the bow or the strings. It isn't going to, you know, cake around anything. No scratchiness, all that kind of stuff. So it does make a difference. Even if you've got cheap strings and you've got a cheaper bow or a violin, it does make a difference if you've got a nice cake of rosin because that's your grip. Without rosin, your violin and your bow does not work. So it always makes sense to buy a nice cake of rosin, I think. 
Um, okay. Let's just have a look. Oh, Garth. I appreciate you entertaining my redneck questions. I look forward to getting your books. The violin for the fiddle. Uh, the violin or the fiddle has to be the most beautiful sound and those that you like can play are amazing. Oh, thank you very much. Wow, you didn't have to do that, but thank you. We appreciate that. That's made my day, that has. Um, right, let's move on. How long have we got left? A few minutes. Uh, right, I'm trying to get through as many of these questions as I possibly can. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm nearly choking there. Katie, no... <coughs> Excuse me. No chimrest may pull the oil out on the varnish and damage it in the long run. So the Marco chimrest are great. Yeah, that's true. I think. Oh, <coughs> choking on my own my own mouth. Yeah. The only thing is, if you've got, depending on what kind of violin you've got as well, if you don't have, I would imagine if I, if 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 I had my chin on here, I would probably yes. I I didn't think of that. I'd probably be wearing. I would. I would definitely wear off the varnish here over, over time. It would just be natural. No more than if you're going up up and down stairs, you wear the carpet out in the middle. So you, you probably would end up damaging this over time with all the oils from the, the skin and things like that. So yes, uh, well mentioned, Katie. Um, um, OP, OP Yemi, I think I've got that right. Hello, it's been a while. Uh, I joined the live less, the live less, the live sessions, if I can read and see at the same time. Uh, yes, I do remember you and I haven't seen you in, seen you in a while. Um, I just want to give you great kudos on your video lessons. So many people do not believe I've learned how to play the violin, violin online. Well done. That's great. They do work. Online lessons do work. Um, okay. I think I have answered everybody's questions. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. I'm just making sure that... Oh, and Mole. I have a lot of tension on the second finger when I attempt to put it close to the first finger. The result is that the pitch is always a little out of tune. Um, maybe it's maybe you just need to adjust what you're doing with the, with the... How you're holding your left hand then. If you've got a lot of tension on there. Um, it's It's a difficult one because it's sort of it's more based on feel for you and of course added with the fact that I can't see what you're doing as well it but it sounds to me if you've just got a lot of tension on there you've you're obviously you know over overcompensating or, or you know bear gripping for dear life up, up here somehow but I think if that's an issue for you it doesn't sound like one of those issues that I've particularly come across before you know one of those those common issues that people have things like bow shaking or you know, general holding the violin or anything like that. It's obviously, it sounds to me like it might be something just more specifically unique to you. So it's something that, that you've got to try and overcome with that. So if you, what, the first thing I would say is that if you feel like your your finger is out of tune, depending on where you feel the finger is out of tune. So if you feel that you're always putting it down and it's um, it's too sharp, aim to bring it back. If you feel it's too flat, uh, too, too far back, bring it forward a little bit. So I've had, I've had instances like that in the past where I've been learning way back in the day. And I've, every time I put my third finger down, it would go down too sharp and it would be annoying. It would just, it would just bugs the hell out of me, anything like that. So what I would tend to consciously do is that I'd be playing my music. And then every time I had to put a third finger down, I would consciously put it down back a bit further than it needed to be you know, it would be on my mind to do that. Or I would circle all of the third fingers in the piece of music. So I didn't forget when I came to doing the third finger. And I knew that for some reason, I just had a tendency to push that third finger forward towards me. So it was too sharp. So every time I put it down, I would aim to put it back and a little bit more, then I put it down and it would be perfect every time. And I did that to the point where I no longer stretched it. It went into the correct place it should do because I just retrained myself for doing it. So I think to try and try and see if you can get the pitch correct first. So adjust the pitch. If it's too sharp or too flat or whatever, adjust it so that every time you put down the second finger, you're fixing the pitch. And you might find that actually resolves a bit of the tension. Uh, have a go at that and let me know how you get on next week. Um... Okay, let me just have a look. Uh, Pershing said something in the Songbook 3 Concertino, the Hungarian uh, Opus 27, when it changes to third position on the A string, sounds bad, not clean, messed up, or I don't know. Any tip? 
it's my favorite piece um, let me just have a quick look for you bear with uh, bar seven so we're referring to so this is uh, this is songbook three. So this is when you get more or less right to the end of the course. And the piece of music that we're referring to is this one here, bar seven. Um, so yes, that's yeah. Okay, I know what you mean. So uh, this question is probably only going to make sense to you. So it's it's a quick it's it's a quick it's a quick go up. So you've got a second finger and then you've got to jump to the first finger and that's very quick. Just practice that, isolate it and practice it. Um... So you'll have to just So practice the G sharp and then practice going to one. So it is. It, it it will be a little bit messy to start with. Um, so you just have just just break it down and practice it. Second finger. You know until you get faster and faster. But yes, I do. I do appreciate it can be a little bit messy there. Um, but you've got to remember as well the style of this piece of music is Hungarian. It. It is a uh, it is a classical piece, I would say, or it's it's um, it's not quite classical genre. It's more a little bit more modern than that, but it's written in that kind of style, um, and it's written in a written in a in a Hungarian style as well. So, nothing these kind of pieces we're not expecting absolute perfection. It's almost like a little bit of what's the word a little bit of messiness if you like or a little bit of scrappiness adds to the hungarian it's you know you've got to imagine that hungarian music is that kind of da, 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 da. it is that sort of it is that kind of get move, get going lively music we're not talking about uh you know a, a mozart's concerto number 40 where every single note has to be precise if that was the case we wouldn't we we wouldn't do something like that but if it's bothering you that much then don't go into third don't go into third position there find another place of going into third position as long as you as long as you're up into third position on that e string there so that you can do a nice get those nice notes uh, done there but remember part of the messiness is part of the style obviously we don't want to trash it completely so that it sounds like complete garbage <laughs> and that we can't do it but you know, don't worry about trying to make it as clean as anything because it's not going to happen. You're not going to get it clean. I think if you probably listened to the recording I did, I don't think I played it as, as clean as that when I was when I when I was doing it anyway. There's always going to be a little something there, but that's fine because it just fits the style and the genre anyway. So don't stress that. But obviously we want to make it as clean as we can. But don't worry if it is a little on the sort of scrappy kind of side. Okay, um, I think we're just coming to an end. I'm just going to make sure there's no super important questions. Um, mm -mm -mm. I played the guitar for two decades before recently starting the violin. I'm not using any tape because my ears develop, but I find pressure tip on my, uh, the pressure on the tip of my finger changes intonation. Don't push down so hard on the violin. You really, really, really don't need to push down so hard on the violin. The one thing I found when I was doing a little bit of um, uh, guitar back in the day a few years ago was that um, I wasn't pressing hard enough. And because of that, I was ending up, I was getting calluses on the tips of my fingers. I had to stop playing the guitar for that reason, because I was getting calluses on the tips of my fingers. Then I was coming back to playing the violin and I couldn't feel, I couldn't feel the notes on, on the string. And it was actually start, it was really starting to affect my intonation from that point. So that's me going from a violinist to a, a go, going to a guitar player. So, um, you're going the other way around. Just don't put so much pressure on it. The violin is not a guitar. It's nothing like it. So a lot less pressure is is needed, really. Um, mm -mm. Okay, last question before we finish, because um, Amy June has just popped in. Hi, Amy. Um, just wondering how you give your violin more volume on the lower strings. Just 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 give a little bit just give it a little bit more more welly when you've got nice strings as well make sure if you want to really beef out the lower make sure you've got a nice set of strings on the lower some strings that are going to cope with that and then you just want to oh let me turn you down so i don't uh i don't blow everyone's eardrums out so 
give yourself a flat bow you want to be playing with lots of bow and you want to put a lot of weight in it from the elbow here so that you're really kind of you don't want to be pushing down to the point where you know you're doing any of that but you just want to be giving it a nice bit of beef you know get the arm stuck into it the g-string is up there for a reason so that you can get your whole arm and and everything kind of lumping in on the violin so you can get a good bit of sound there so just go for it you have to just go for it um uh oh gilbert wow 20 dollars. <laughs> thank you they're all coming in today thank you thank you so much everyone i really 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 do appreciate it and i appreciate everybody that uh that shows up and watches my videos but thank you gilbert um thank you so much and thank you to everybody else that has uh donated today as well i i truly i do appreciate it thank you uh, right, I'm going to end it there. I'm really sorry if I'm just making sure there's no other questions that I've missed. I'm really sorry if I've missed your question. I've tried to answer as many as I can. If I have missed it again, I apologise. We'll do another live. Um, you're welcome, Amy. We'll do another live next week. And if you're there and you can tune in same time, same day, same everything, uh, you can answer your quest uh, ask your question there. If you're absolutely def desperate and you need an answer right now, write it in any of the comments underneath, uh, write it in the comments, sorry, under any video and I will answer it if you're absolutely desperate and cannot wait till next week. But if not, um, I will see you next week, um, armed and ready to answer all of your questions. Have a great weekend. And again, thank you so much to those of you that have donated in today's video. Uh, I truly just bottom of my heart. I do, I do appreciate it. It makes my weekend. So thank you so much and have a good week and I will see you same time next week. Bye, everyone.